Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Last week, while preparing our lesson on hypersonic flight, I was busy getting ready to travel and visit my mother, who is still going strong after spending half a century as a nurse. Mothers have a unique place in our life, and Mother's Day is an important time. So I was rushing when I looked at the normal shock tables and calculated the temperature at Mach 5. As soon as I did, I was surprised by the value I got. T1 is the upstream temperature, before compression in the shock wave. T2 is the downstream temperature that an aircraft experiences flying just behind the shock wave. Now don't confuse the shock wave with the sound barrier. You can outrun the sound and have it chase you along, but you never outrun the shock wave in front of the ship. The shock wave itself can be at unbelievable temperatures, over 20,000 Kelvin, but the boundary layer protects the ship from this extreme heat blocking both convection and conduction. What makes it through the boundary layer is the infrared light that shines like a heat lamp onto the hull of the ship, producing the temperature felt on the surface. Here I was clearly given the temperature in Kelvin, but to help everyone relate to that temperature, I converted it into both Celsius and Fahrenheit. I ignored the Fahrenheit, though it has more intuitive meaning to most Americans, and looked at the conversion factor here which should be multiplied by T1 to get T2. And I multiplied 20 Celsius by 5.8 and got 116 Celsius. I remember feeling an immediate qualm. This seemed awfully low, but I ignored that feeling because I was in a hurry. That's where peer review comes in. Thousands of you review these lessons every week, and sometimes you find where I got a math problem wrong. And the Medal of Truth goes to Murray Pearson who found this mistake and pointed it out to me. Your best friends are always the ones who tell you kindly when you've messed up. I joke that these occasional errors are put here on purpose, to keep you all on your toes, but you know the truth. I made a mistake. While I love mathematics and working complex equations, I am a big picture guy. I fall more onto the creative side of science. There is evidence to support the theory that the non-dominant cerebral hemisphere is dedicated more toward creativity, pattern recognition, and fast assessments. And being nonverbal, it can only give us a strange feeling that something is wrong, sometimes in the pit of our stomach, without specifying exactly what. That feeling is not always right, but more often than not, we should take a close look at what we're working on. This feeling is telling us something. Then we can use the dominant hemisphere, with its logic, reason, speech, and writing, to figure out exactly what is wrong. I have a lesson planned on the importance of creativity in science, but for now, let's say that we should listen to that feeling and take the time to reevaluate our conclusions. I know that when the X-15 went hypersonic, that the floor of the aircraft became red hot. This would not have happened to Inconel at 116 Celsius. It should have been obvious, and if I had rechecked my calculations, I would have realized that by using Celsius, I was not using an absolute scale of temperature as you must in these equations. What if the temperature had been zero Celsius? Would we then calculate that T2 was also zero? That's ridiculous. And that's why the table is given in Kelvin. Kelvin is an absolute scale of temperature, meaning it starts at absolute zero. I try to think in metric and usually do okay, but conversions throw my brain off track. The Rankine scale is another absolute scale of thermodynamic temperature. Named for the physicist McCorn Rankine, it starts at absolute zero also, but increases by the same measure as the Fahrenheit scale. Some industries in America still use Rankine, just as the United States still uses pounds, horsepower, and feet per second in industry. But scientists should always select the scale most likely to reduce error. Metric is used around the world, while imperial is only used by a few countries. The metric scale for temperature is Celsius, but scientists should always use Kelvin. By just adding 273.15 degrees, we can come up with the Kelvin value. Because only a true measure of a material's heat energy will give you the correct answer. If we finally meet alien scientists out in the universe, we will almost certainly not use the same temperature scale. But it is certain that we will all start at the same absolute zero. If I had used Kelvin, I would have multiplied 283 Kelvin by 5.8 and gotten 1,641 Kelvin. This would be about 1,368 Celsius, 
or almost 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That makes a lot more sense. This was the temperature reflected back on the X-15, and what will be felt by the Halcyon when it takes to the skies. As we discussed, the X-15 used a heat sink, active cooling with ammonia fuel, to reduce the heat load on the skin of the ship. Halcyon will probably use its methane fuel in a similar manner, sending the absorbed heat through the engine. Our calculations at Mach 10 to 12 used this scale, which gave us T2 in Kelvin, so our estimates for the Kinjal hypersonic missile were correct. The Kinjal does not use active cooling because it is not reusable and does not have to survive long. Think of temperature as the scale we use to quantify heat energy. Heat is the kinetic motion of subatomic particles, as we've discussed before. At absolute zero, all atomic motion would cease and we would know exactly where every particle was. This, it turns out, is impossible to do. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle tells us that we can never know with absolute precision the location and velocity of a subatomic particle at the quantum level. These are really probability waves and not discrete particles. At the macro scale, they seem like a solid object, but even solid objects are deceiving. The electron shell closest to the nucleus can hold two electron probability waves. A proton has a diameter of only about 1.7 femtometers. If we made this a sphere one meter in diameter, the electrons would be 52,800 meters away. When two atoms come near each other, like in a gas, these electron shells approach each other and both having a negative charge repel each other by exchanging photons. This exchange of photons is all we ever actually feel. Now to study heat. We can think of these electron shells as steel balls, bouncing off each other with perfect elasticity. The speed at which they are bouncing around is a form of kinetic energy. The mass of the atom and the speed they are moving determine how much heat energy, also called thermal energy, is contained in a substance. That substance can be a solid, liquid, gas, Bose-Einstein condensate, or plasma. In a solid, all the atoms are fixed in place. This is an ordered arrangement. As they vibrate in place, their movement gives them momentum. Heavier atoms will have more momentum and therefore will hold more heat energy, despite being at the same temperature. A block of iron at 283 Kelvin has a lot more energy than a block of the much lighter metal aluminum. Other factors like atomic and molecular bonds and rotations and quantum effects matter also. The amount of heat that must be added to an object to raise its temperature is measured by heat capacity. Change in heat, delta Q, over change in time, delta T. Heat capacity, also called thermal capacity, is the amount of heat that must be supplied to an object to produce a unit change in its temperature, joules per Kelvin. If we divide this measure by mass, we get specific heat capacity, denoted with a small c. Now let's look at entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder or randomness in a closed system. In a closed thermodynamic system, it is also a quantitative measure of the amount of thermal energy not available to do work. Let's take a close look at this. Vibrating in place is how solids contain heat energy. Thermal energy can be added until the particles vibrate so much that they start to move out of place, but still keep sticking together, thus becoming a liquid. We call this melting. Energy must be absorbed to break the bonds that held the particles as a solid. That means when you add heat to a solid, the temperature goes up and then plateaus. The plateau is where the energy is going into breaking the bonds. Once the solid has become a liquid, the temperature starts to rise again. If heated enough to where the kinetic energy of the liquid becomes higher than the kinetic energy of the atmosphere, the liquid now becomes a gas. This phase shift is called vaporization. And here you can see its plateau. This is the specific heat of vaporization. Some solids go straight to a gas, like the carbon dioxide on Mars, which is the same as the dry ice in your grocery store. This phase shift is called sublimation. Any phase shift either gives off or absorbs energy. If it gives off energy, we call it exothermic. If it absorbs energy, we call it endothermic. If a gas is heated to the point that the gas particle collisions knock some of the electrons off, this material becomes a plasma, the fourth state of matter, as you see here. The entropy or randomness of the system increases as matter phase shifts from solid to liquid to gas to plasma. When everything is added up in any closed system, entropy must increase for work to be done.
Understanding the flow of heat energy was critical to developing the engines that power our society today. Unless we expend energy to pump heat, it naturally flows from a high energy state to a lower one. When we do pump energy, we create more entropy in the energy we burn than we reverse by pumping the heat from a cold area to a hotter one. If you were to put a hot pan on a cold counter, the heat energy in the pan would move into the counter. This flow of heat was described by scientists in the 19th century. This is the normal flow of heat. If we were to use a cryocooler powered by electricity, we could reverse this flow, but we would have to expend energy to do so. During the 19th century, Lord Kelvin developed the concept of a heat pump, a device capable of absorbing heat in one place and depositing it in another. This is the cryocooler we discussed. He also developed the concept of absolute zero, calculating the heat energy in a gas and calculating the point at which all atomic motion would stop. This is called zero Kelvin, usually given as negative 273.15 Celsius, which is minus 459.76 Fahrenheit, also just called absolute zero. Empty space between planets is only about 2.7 Kelvin, but that is still a lot higher than absolute zero. The closest we have ever gotten to absolute zero was about 38 trillionths of a degree Kelvin. Researchers were able to use lasers to cool gaseous atoms of an element like rubidium. The lasers would kick out atoms of a higher temperature or use the right frequency of photons to slow them down, or both. This must be done in a vacuum. Einstein and Bose had predicted that particles called bosons would have a special property. Bosons are one of two types of particles in our universe. Those that have a spin quantum number that is an integer value, 0, 1, 2, and so on, which we call bosons, can all crowd together without interfering with each other. And those that have a half-integer spin, 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, etc., cannot merge together like this, and we call them fermions. After Enrico Fermi, and spelled this way. Einstein and Bose postulated that when bosons get ultra-cold, they will condense into a single superatom. This is called a Bose-Einstein condensate in their honor, and is the fifth state of matter. This is also an important hallmark of science. When we postulate a theory, we make predictions. When these predictions come true, we have strong support for our theory. Now we understand the concepts of temperature, heat, and entropy, and we need to discuss enthalpy. Enthalpy is the sum of a thermodynamic system's internal energy and the product of its pressure and volume. H equals U plus P times V. In this equation, H represents the total enthalpy of all subsystems. U is the internal energy. This is the sum of all kinetic, potential, chemical, electrical, nuclear, and other energy associated with the system. P is the pressure and V is the volume. Enthalpy can be described as specific enthalpy, denoted with a lowercase h, as the total enthalpy, divided by mass, lowercase h equals uppercase h divided by m, or molar enthalpy. We divide by number of moles, and get uppercase H, M equals uppercase H divided by N. Why do we go through all of this? Because we need to understand these systems, to at least a basic degree, to understand modern rocket engines. Let's look at something that seems simple. We have a tank of fuel and a tank of oxidizer. We have pressurized these tanks with very high pressure helium, and there is no pump. We use helium because it is a very small atom that does not easily bond with itself or other elements. That makes it the perfect pressurizing agent. So this is a pressure-fed rocket engine. Each of these tanks are at a certain temperature. We'll call this T-fuel and T-ox for fuel and oxidizer. If the fuel is liquid hydrogen, it will be at or below 20 Kelvin. For liquid oxygen, it would be about 70 Kelvin. That means we would need quite a bit of insulation between these tanks. If the fuel were methane, we could cool it to 70 Kelvin also and use a metal common dome. If it were kerosene, we would need to still have insulation to keep the cold of the liquid oxygen from making the kerosene too thick to flow properly. We could use hypergolic fuels, like the UDMH and NTO used in the Draco RCS thrusters, and in the Super Draco abort escape engines. These can be at room temperature. The outside air is at ambient temperature since we are on Earth, and we'll call this T0. We have a pipe running to these valves that open and allow the fuel and oxidizer to run into the combustion chamber. Liquids don't mix well and can't combust. So how do we turn these liquids into a gas in this engine? One way is to pump them through something called a pentel. This is a pentel. 
When the liquid goes through these small tubes, the volume is reduced. To compensate, the pressure increases. When the high-pressure liquid is expelled through these holes, we now have a liquid going from high pressure to low pressure, and this causes the liquid to partially vaporize. When a gas is compressed to a liquid, it gives off heat. When a liquid is vaporized to a gas, it absorbs heat. But where does the heat energy for this phase transition come from? It turns out that the temperature of the tank drops, as does the temperature of the vaporized gas. This has to be accounted for in your calculations. And that is where the heat comes from. Thus, as we open the valves and start to fire our rocket engine, we are supercooling our liquid propellants at a time when we need to be adding heat and turning the liquid to gas. The pentel helps, but now we have a very cold gas vapor that we are trying to ignite. And not all of the fuel and oxidizer transition to vapor. Liquids can put out your igniter flame or drown a spark. Is there a better way to do this? Let's look back at the SpaceX Starship. There are two turbo pumps, one for oxygen and one for methane. Both have their own preburner. These preburners power the turbo pumps. Most other rocket engines use either a fuel rich preburner, like the Space Shuttle main engine, or an oxygen rich preburner, like the Blue Origin BE 4. Having two turbo pumps allows each of them to work half as hard as just having one. This allows them to run cooler and last longer. And most fuels like liquid hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and even RP 1 can be used to absorb excess heat. We have to be careful with RP-1 because it will start to polymerize pretty easily. And methane and ammonia can also if they're heated too much. But for hydrogen, this is not a problem. These cold liquids can be used to cool the combustion chamber and nozzle where they are flashed into vapor. Some of the heated fuel can be sent back to pressurize the fuel tank also. This hot gas offsets the cooling effects of the phase shift from liquid to gas. We can't, however, pump hot fuel into the oxygen tank, or things would not go well. In the Starship, we see that liquid oxygen is used to cool this part of the oxygen-rich turbo pump. That flashes the liquid into a gas, and we can use that very hot oxygen gas to pressurize and heat the oxygen tank. Now the hot methane gas and hot oxygen gas can combine in the combustion chamber at very high pressures without combustion instabilities. Solutions like these show the genius of the SpaceX engineers, and why the full flow stage combustion Raptor engine is unmatched anywhere on Earth. But it is not impossible to compete with this engine. Pangea Aerospace is helping the Europeans develop a 3 meganewton aerospike engine. That's 3,000 kilonewtons. That's right. This will be an efficient closed cycle rocket engine, more powerful and potentially more efficient than the Raptor. We'll bring you more as details come out. And remember, keep that feedback coming, and we appreciate you. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and support us on Patreon if you can, and stay safe. At Astra Proterra.